Lesson 13 The End of God's Mission Sabbath Afternoon December 23 God expects those who bear the name of Christ to represent Him in thought, word, and deed. Their thoughts are to be pure and their words and deeds noble and uplifting, drawing those around them nearer to the Savior. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in this world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last message of mercy for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. What manner of persons then ought they to be? There needs to be a deeper work of grace in the hearts of God's people. Less of self and more of Christ must be seen. Tests close and sharp are coming to all. The religion of the Bible must be interwoven with all that we do and say, fragrant with the presence of God. In Heavenly Places, page 332. The purpose which God seeks to accomplish through His people today is the same that He desired to accomplish through Israel when He brought them forth out of Egypt. By beholding the goodness, the mercy, the justice, and the love of God revealed in the Church, the world is to have a representation of His character. And when the law of God is thus exemplified in the life, even the world will recognize the superiority of those who love and fear and serve God above every other people on the earth. The Lord has His eye upon every one of His people. He has His plans concerning each. It is His purpose that those who practice His holy precepts shall be a distinguished people. To the people of God today, as well as to ancient Israel, belong the words written by Moses through the spirit of inspiration. Thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6. Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 12. As a people, we must prepare the way of the Lord under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is to be given in its purity. The stream of living water is to deepen and widen in its course. In all fields, nigh and afar off, men will be called from the plow and from the more common commercial business vocations that largely occupy the mind, and will be educated in connection with men of experience. As they learn to labor effectively, they will proclaim the truth with power. Through most wonderful workings of divine providence, mountains of difficulty will be removed and cast into the sea. The message that means so much to the dwellers upon the earth will be heard and understood. Men will know what is truth. Onward and still onward, the work will advance until the whole earth shall have been warned, and then shall the end come. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, Page 9 Sunday, December 24 Revelation, God's Last Day Mission as we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. The last book of the New Testament scriptures is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study. But Christ through his servant John has here declared what shall be in the last days, and he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. This is life eternal, Christ said, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. John chapter 17, verse 3. Why is it that we do not realize the value of this knowledge? Why are not these glorious truths glowing in our hearts, trembling upon our lips, and pervading our whole being? Christ's Object Lessons, page 133 The Lord will work through the human agent who unites himself to Jesus Christ. Those who have an abiding trust in Christ will, 
like Enoch, have a sense of the abiding presence of God? Why is it that there are so many who feel in uncertainty, who feel that they are orphans? It is because they do not cultivate faith in the precious assurance that the Lord Jesus is their sin bearer. It was in behalf of those who had transgressed the law that Jesus took upon him human nature and became like unto us in order that we might have everlasting peace and assurance. We have an advocate in the heavens, and whosoever accepts him as his personal Savior is not left an orphan to bear the curse of his own sins. Sons and Daughters of God, page 287 the Church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through His Church shall be reflected to the world His fullness and His sufficiency. The members of the Church, those whom He has called out of darkness into His marvelous light, are to show forth His glory. The Church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ, and through the Church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the final and full display of the love of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Through centuries of persecution, conflict, and darkness, God has sustained His Church. Not one cloud has fallen upon it that he has not prepared for. Not one opposing force has risen to counterwork his work that he has not foreseen. All has taken place as he predicted. He has not left his church forsaken, but has traced in prophetic declarations what would occur, and that which his spirit inspired the prophets to foretell has been brought about. All his purposes will be fulfilled. His law is linked with His throne, and no power of evil can destroy it. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 9 and 11. Monday, December 25. The Three Angels' Messages and Mission We see in God's Word revealed the great plan of human redemption, the means devised to free mankind from the power of Satan. We see Christ, the captain of our salvation, meeting the prince of darkness in open battle and single-handed obtaining the victory in our behalf. We learn, too, that by this victory was opened to us a door of hope, a source of strength, and that we may, as faithful soldiers, fight our own battles with the wily foe and conquer in the name of Jesus. The powers of darkness must be met by every soul. The young as well as the old will be assailed, and all should understand the nature of the great controversy between Christ and Satan and should realize that it concerns themselves. It is not enough to have an intellectual knowledge of the truth. There must be an entrance of the word into the heart. It must be set home by the power of the Holy Spirit. The will must be brought into harmony with its requirements. Not only the intellect, but the heart and conscience must concur in the acceptance of the truth. That I May Know Him, page 192. The commission given to the disciples is given also to us. Today, as then, a crucified and risen Savior is to be uplifted before those who are without God and without hope in the world. The Lord calls for pastors, teachers, and evangelists. From door to door, His servants are to proclaim the message of salvation. To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, the tidings of pardon through Christ are to be carried. Not with tame, lifeless utterances is the message to be given, but with clear, decided, stirring utterances. Hundreds are waiting for the warning to escape for their lives. The world needs to see in Christians an evidence of the power of Christianity. Not merely in a few places, but throughout the world, messages of mercy are needed. Gospel Workers, page 29. For the joy that was set before him, Christ endured the cross. He died on the cross as a sacrifice for the world, and through this sacrifice comes the greatest blessing that God could bestow, the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
This blessing is for all who will receive Christ. The fallen world is the battlefield for the greatest conflict the heavenly universe and earthly powers have ever witnessed. It was appointed as the theater on which would be fought out the grand struggle between good and evil, between heaven and hell. Every human being acts a and must either accept or reject the world's Redeemer. All are witnesses, either for or against Christ. Christ calls upon those who stand under his banner to engage in the conflict with him as faithful soldiers, that they may inherit the crown of life. They have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. Lift him up, page 253. Tuesday, December 26. The Final Crisis. The gospel of Christ is to reach all classes, all nations, all tongues, and people. The influence of the gospel is to unite in one great brotherhood. We have only one model that we are to imitate in character building, and then we all shall have Christ's mold. We shall be in perfect harmony. Nationalities will blend in Jesus Christ, having the same mind and the same judgment, speaking the same things, and with one mouth glorifying God. This is the work the world's Redeemer is to do for us. If we accept the truth as it is in Jesus, national prejudices and jealousies will be broken down, and the Spirit of truth will blend hearts in one. We will love as brethren, we will esteem others better than ourselves, we will be kind and courteous, meek and lowly, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. Our High Calling, page 171. When you look at the cross of Calvary, you cannot doubt God's love or his willingness to save. He has worlds upon worlds that give him divine honor, and heaven and all the universe would have been just as happy if he had left this world to perish. But so great was his love for the fallen race that he gave his own dear son to die that they might be redeemed from eternal death. As we see the care, the love that God has for us, let us respond to it. Let us give to Jesus all the powers of our being, fighting manfully the battles of the Lord. We cannot afford to lose our souls. We cannot afford to sin against God. Life, eternal life in the kingdom of glory, is worth everything. That I may know him, page 367. Those whom Christ commends in the judgment may have known little of theology, but they have cherished his principles. Through the influence of the Divine Spirit, they have been a blessing to those about them. Even among the heathen are those who have cherished the spirit of kindness. Before the words of life had fallen upon their ears, they have befriended the missionaries, even ministering to them at the peril of their own lives. Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly, those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and have done the things that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of God. How surprised and gladdened will be the lowly among the nations and among the heathen to hear from the lips of the Savior, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. How glad will be the heart of infinite love as his followers look up with surprise and joy at his words of approval. The Desire of Ages, page 638. Wednesday, December 27. Success in Mission. Paul had sought to impress upon the minds of his Corinthian brethren the fact that he and the ministers associated with him were but men commissioned by God to teach the truth, that they were all engaged in the same work, and that they were alike dependent upon God for success in their labors. The discussion that had arisen in the church regarding the relative merits of different ministers was not in the order of God, but was the result of cherishing the attributes of the natural heart. While one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? 
And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4-7 to The Acts of the Apostles, page 273 It was Paul who had first preached the gospel in Corinth and who had organized the church there. This was the work that the Lord had assigned him. Later, by God's direction, other workers were brought in to stand in their lot and place. The seed sown must be watered, and this Apollos was to do. He followed Paul in his work, to give further instruction, and to help the seed sown to develop. He won his way to the hearts of the people, but it was God who gave the increase. It is not human, but divine power that works transformation of character. Those who plant and those who water do not cause the growth of the seed. They work under God as His appointed agencies, cooperating with Him in His work. To the master worker belongs the honor and glory that comes with success. The Acts of the Apostles, page 274. Jesus desires to efface the image of the earthly from the minds of his followers and to impress upon them the image of the heavenly, that they may become one with himself, reflecting his character, and showing forth the praises of him who hath called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. The character we cultivate, the attitude we assume today, is fixing our future destiny. We are all making a choice either to be with the blessed inside the city of light or to be with the wicked outside the city. The principles which govern our actions on earth are known in heaven and our deeds are faithfully chronicled in the books of record. It is there known whether our characters are after the order of Christ. Are we wise virgins? This is the question which we are deciding today by our character and attitude. Reflecting Christ, page 303. Thursday, December 28. Mission complete. Christ tells us when the day of his kingdom shall be ushered in. He does not say that all the world will be converted, but that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten the coming of the day of God. Christ is coming with clouds and with great glory. A multitude of shining angels will attend him. He will come to raise the dead and to change the living saints from glory to glory. He will come to honor those who have loved him and kept his commandments and to take them to himself. He has not forgotten them nor his promise. A little longer and we shall see the King in his beauty. A little longer and he will wipe all tears from our eyes. A little longer and he will present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jude 24. Heaven, pages 161 and 162. The glorious city of God has twelve gates set with pearls most glorious. It also has twelve foundations of various colors. The streets of the city are of pure gold. In this city is the throne of God, and a pure, beautiful river proceeding out of it, as clear as crystal. Its sparkling purity and beauty make glad the city of God. The saints will drink freely of the healing waters of the river of life. All faces will reflect the image of their Redeemer. There will then be no anxious, troubled countenances, but all will be bright and smiling in spotless purity. The angels will be there, also the resurrected saints with the martyrs, and the best of all, and what will cause us the most joy, our lovely Savior, who suffered and died that we might enjoy that happiness and freedom, will be there. His glorious face will shine brighter than the sun and light up the beautiful city and reflect glory all around. My Life Today, page 357. In the city of God, there shall be no night. None will need or desire repose. There will be no weariness in doing the will of God and offering praise to his name. 
We shall ever feel the freshness of the morning and shall ever be far from its close. The light of the sun will be superseded by a radiance which is not painfully dazzling, yet which immeasurably surpasses the brightness of our noontide. The glory of God and the Lamb floods the holy city with unfading light. The redeemed walk in the sunless glory of perpetual day. I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Revelation chapter 21 verse 22. The people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. Now we see through a glass darkly. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 12. We behold the image of God reflected as in a mirror in the works of nature and in his dealings with men. But then we shall see him face to face without a dimming veil between. The Great Controversy, page 676. For further reading, Reflecting Christ, God Reveals His Justice and Love, page 58, and Lift Him Up, Christ Died for Us, page 233.